good afternoon for those of you who are in Western Australia and good evening for those of you who are in Eastern Australia. My name is Sophie Honeybourne and I'll be presenting to you um, this afternoon. And of course we're going to be looking at the picture books in, um, that are shortlisted in this year's Children's Book Council of Australia um, shortlist awards, which of course um, will be announced in a couple of weeks' time, so it's very exciting. Um, as I said, my name is Sophie. I have been lucky enough to co-author the um, Peters Exploring the CBCA shortlist for the last three years. I'm currently on maternity leave as an assistant principal from a school in Sydney, and um, I think we'll just get started. Okay, so, so for those of you who have never done a webinar before, um, I'm going to get you used to the format so that you can interact with me. So you'll see on your screen appearing now a little web poll, and it just asks um, if you have participated in a webinar before. So when you see that little um, web poll appear, if you can just click your answer, and um, that's one of the ways that you can interact with me. Oh, sorry, it's not actually a web poll. If you can just type the message, I do apologize. So some of you have been looking in the message box. If you can just use that message box in the bottom right of your screen and just type yes or no to let me know if you've ever participated in a webinar before. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to put your cups of tea down. No? Welcome? Yes? No? No? Okay, great. All right, so for those of you who haven't participated in a webinar before, there are a couple of ways that you can interact with me. And another way, as well as the message box, is um, the feedback. Now, if you have a look at your screen, uh, just underneath the address bar at the top, you'll see a little um, icon called feedback. Now, if you click on that, you can give me a wave. It's, it's a little red raise hand. And that'll come up next to your name, and that'll sort of show me that, you, that you're here and you're saying hello. So that's another little way that you can say hello. So if you can click on your raise hand now. I've just done that so you can see. Well done. Good work, guys. Okay, thank you. And um, finally, if you can just type in a little message at the bottom just so I know who I'm talking to. If you can let me know what year you teach at the moment, please, or if you're a librarian, or if you're currently attending as a staff or a school, um, and also what state you're from. So if you just write, say, Year 3 WA, um, just so I can get a nice idea of who I'm talking to. So Year 2, K-2, to two, Queensland, WA, New South Wales. Gosh, we've got quite, a, quite an audience. Pre-service teacher, welcome. Excellent. All right, guys. So that's just a, a brief introduction to the format today. You're welcome to type in any questions or comments throughout um, the presentation. And also, if you feel that I'm talking too quickly or too slowly or you want to give me some feedback, you can use that feedback icon at the top that I showed you earlier. All right, so today, um, this is a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at. Um, the first part of the presentation, I'm going to really um, set the context for what we're going to be talking about today. The aim of this presentation is to um, give you a really good overview of all of the picture books that have been um, shortlisted in this year's um, Book Council Awards, um, not just the books that are in the picture books category, so I want to make that really, really clear. And hopefully by the end of today's session, you'll have a really good understanding of um, some of the visual and multimodal aspects of those texts and also how you can use them to program in a cross-curricular format thematically. Um, and also we'll be looking at some of the um, literacy demands of those texts as well. But before we go into those texts in detail, um, we're going to have a, a brief look at what is quality literature and also talk about the terms multimo multimodal and um, discuss some aspects of visual literacy so we're all on the same page. We're going to briefly touch on the Australian Curriculum English, because I know that every state is in a different level and stage with its implementation. Then I'm going to take you through um, Peter's Digital Units of Work, which are, a company, um, which are actually Peter's CBCA guide for this year. So we're not actually publishing um, the guide in print any longer. They will, these units of work will be available digitally. So I'm going to take you through how to access those and how they work. And then we're going to get into the shortlist. Um, We'll be, I'll, I'll be taking you through the categories that have picture books in them, 
Then I'm going to be taking you through some of the themes and how the picture books link to those themes. We're going to be looking at some of the literacy aspects, like I mentioned, and then we're going to explore four texts in detail, and you're also going to do one activity um, based on one of the other texts, and that was what um, some people were, were messaging about, that's not a daffodil. So there is a link there in the messages if you scroll back up, and we'll talk about it. Okay. So before we start talking about the picture books, I think it's really important to set the context and talk about what is quality literature and why we need to use it in the classroom. For me, quality literature is all about building students' literacy skills. Um, I don't know about you guys, but my personal experience is that children's critical literacy skills um, on some levels haven't actually been improving. I think they've been overwhelmed with so much, um, so many different modes and texts that they have to read in their world um, that unfortunately their, their critical literacy skills are diminishing um, in kind of direct relation to the amount of texts that are coming in. And quality literature is an excellent way to really get those critical literacy skills back up again. So there's three main reasons why quality literature is, um, you know, is an excellent way to teach literacy in the classroom. The first of all is that it provides context. So we'll just, having a look here. So the context of quality literature is that really it, it enables students to experience um, lots of kind of big real world issues in quite a safe way. Of course, quality literature texts, we talk about them are authentic, authentic texts. They're not texts that are produced um, for perhaps a reading level or um, to tick a box. They're not learning in a box at all. So, and as, as a result, they are messy, they are real world, and they do help our children to understand some of the challenges involved with reading real texts. And of course, as teachers, one of the most important things that we can um, help our students to, um, some of the skills we can help them to, to gain are the skills of being quality writers. And of course, if you're reading quality literature, you've got an excellent model for high expectations there to become a quality writer. The second reason why it's important to use quality literature in the classroom is, of course, engagement. Um, you know, we all know that kids love good stories, even if they can't read them themselves. You know, it doesn't mean that the teacher can't read them to them. And if kids are engaged, as we all know, they want to learn. Quality literature is also an excellent way for kids to engage culturally with, um, with all sorts of different cultures, both within Australia and, of course, globally now as, as we move towards being more global citizens. And, of course, quality texts um, really help students to become more emotionally engaged with, with subject content and area and, and really develop those emotional intelligence skills. And then, finally, another excellent reason for using quality literature in the classroom is, of course, to build those 21st century skills. As we all know, we're currently preparing our kids for jobs that we can't even predict what they're going to be like. Um, and so rather than teaching from a knowledge perspective, we have to start shifting towards a skills base. And I've already talked a lot about critical literacy, but we also need to be thinking about um, the general capabilities that are across the Australian curriculum. Um, we also need to be thinking about enhancing our students' creativity skills and, of course, their skills in problem solving. And quality literature sets up an excellent model for um, developing all of those skills. Okay, so moving on to multimodal text, because, of course, we're going to be looking at multimodal text today. So for those of you who um, aren't quite sure or perhaps need a bit of a refresher, multimodal text use them more, more than one mode. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, the modes include both visual, um, and that's still and moving, written and verbal, oral, which is, of course, audio, and also gestural and spatial. But we're mainly going to be looking at, of course, the visual and the written today, and then, of course, the oral comes into it to a certain extent when the texts are read aloud. Um, the most important thing to understand about multimodal text is that the meaning is communicated by a combination of modes. So the New Australian Curriculum, um, English, has this wonderful quote, the processes of listening, speaking, reading, viewing, and writing, also known as language modes, are interrelated and the learning of one often supports and extends the learning of the others. So as we go through the text today, we're going to be keeping that in the back of our mind, that the readings that we're going to be doing are based on a combination of the visual and, of course, the written. Okay, so a little web poll here for you. 
I'd like to um, just find out how regularly do you teach the literacy of multimodal text in your classroom? I've found um, that there's always a vast, vast range of people, um, of teachers teaching multimodal text. So it'd be interesting to see whether some of you teach often, sometimes rarely or never. If you could kindly fill in that web poll, please. So you just click the box and then click answer. Okay, so we've got fantastic. So we've got some people, lots of people saying sometimes mainly. One person saying often and no one for rarely or never. So that's great guys, fantastic. All right, well we might go through um, the next section a little bit more quickly so that we can really get into the text because you obviously all know what you're talking about. Okay, so really quickly, some visual literacy key terms. And the reason I want to establish these terms is just so that when we're talking um, later about some of the text, we're all clear about the terminology that I'm using. So the first term that I'm going to be talking about is salient. So that's obviously what is most obvious in the text. Um, it doesn't always mean what is closest. Um, however, and obviously, if you were looking at this webcam as a text, my face would be the most salient object. Um, the reading path. This is how your eyes move around the page. So what do your eyes look at first? What do they go to next? And where do they end up? And vectors are the lines that encourage the movement of your reading path. So often they might come from, say, someone's eyes. So if I'm looking down, if I'm looking across down here or this way, that would be encouraging you to follow where I'm looking and start you on a reading path. The next term that I'll be looking at and there's a few kind of different elements to this term is, of course, the composition. Be looking at the layout, how images are framed. Are the images positioned in the foreground or in the background? And are they to the left or to the right of, um, of the, the picture? And finally, we'll be talking about gaze. Right now, I'm demanding your attention because I'm looking at you. However, if I was looking away, I would be offering you um, uh, I'd be offering you attention because you would have to, um, yeah, you'd have to kind of have a think about what I'm looking at and where I'm going. Okay. And of course, putting all of that together, when we're talking about multi multimodal literacy, today we're going to be using visual literacy skills to decode the still and the moving images, as I've talked already. We're using the, the written literacy skills to analyze genre, mood, structure, and grammar. We're going to be using the oral and the oral, oral and oral literacy skills in a similar way to the to the reading of the written, and then of course we're going to be putting all of these together to create a new meaning. And I guess whilst we're talking about comprehension, one of the really important things to think about with um, multimodal literacy as well is that it's an excellent way to um, to deepen and develop students' um, inferential and applied comprehension skills because of course they're putting together more than one interpretation or more than one reading together to create a new reading or a new comprehension. Okay, so very quickly that was our um, that was our brief um, journey through multimodal and visual literacy. And now we're gonna just have a quick chat about the Australian English curriculum. So you'll see a web poll coming up and this this should be quite interesting because I know that lots of different states are in very, very different stages of implementation. So to what extent are you familiar with the Australian curriculum in your classroom? So are you currently using it to plan, teach, and assess? Are you having training? Have you just read it? Or are you not familiar with it at all? I always find the answer to this quite interesting. Okay, so today, yet yeah, very, very broad range of answers again. So a couple of people, um, you know, currently using it. Some people have read it, and, um, you know, some people, very honest, not familiar with it at all. And of course, if your state's not, um, not implementing it yet, of course you're not familiar with it. Okay, thanks. That was, again, quite interesting. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Australian um, English curriculum, it's organized around three main strands. You've got your literacy, your literature, and your language. And under those are different substrands. And um, But woven across those three strands are the modes of writing, speaking, reading, and listening. And of course, when you think about reading, you're thinking about um, viewing as well. So, And there are quite a lot of references to viewing in the Australian curriculum. 
Okay, so this rather colourful and complicated table um, basically takes you through the substrands in the Australian curriculum, and then I'm going to show you how these substrands are linked to the digital units of work that Peter have produced this year um, about the CBCA shortlist. So first of all, we're going to have a look at the literature strand over here. And there are four main substrands here. You've got literature and context, responding to literature, examining literature, and creating literature. In literacy, you've got four substrands as well, text and context, interacting with others, interpreting, analyzing, and evaluating, and creating text. And of course, in language, we've got five over here. So you've got language variation and change, language for interaction, text structure and organization, expressing and developing ideas, and sound and letter knowledge. Now, this is where the colorful, um, the color coding comes in. So in Peter's digital units, they are designed in a way to be a bridge between what teachers are currently doing in the classroom and how they're programming with their state syllabi and how some teachers are now programming with the Australian curriculum. So in the Peter digital units of work, there are um, six well, six main headings and seven headings for picture books. So the first heading, under the heading of literature and literacy, you'll be exploring the context of literature. And of course, you can see that that directly links to the context of literature substrand in the literature area. And also to text and context in literacy. So the idea behind this is that really you're looking at the context of, of the book. Um, what are the themes? What are some of the things um, that you need to build the field knowledge around for students to, to explore and understand the text? The next um, heading is examining literature. And that, of course, links directly into examining literature. And that's really where you're looking at aspects of plot, character, and setting um, in um, narratives, obviously, and some of the other aspects of, um, of factual texts as well. In responding to literature, of course, that also links into the literature strand there. And responding to literature is really developing their own points of view about the literature that they've read. And then, of course, creating literature comes into both literature and literacy strands, and that's about creating text. Moving on, looking at the language strand in the Peter Digital Units of Work, you will see that at text level, students will, um, well, the units of work will help students to examine text structure and cohesion, including punctuation. And as you can see, that comes from interpreting, analyzing, and evaluating a text structure or an organization. And then at the sentence and word levels, students will be examining grammar and vocabulary, and that comes from expressing and developing ideas. Just to let you know, these one, two, three, four substrands that are left over are not actually addressed in Peter's digital units of work. And of course, finally, um, for the visual text, you'll be examining visual and multimodal features. This might not um, make much sense now, but hopefully it's going to make a lot of sense in um, a couple of seconds when we switch across to show you the Peter Digital Units of Work online. So I'm just going to share my screen with you now, and we're going to go onto the web and have a look at Peter's website. So what you'll see coming up is um, the first page of the, of the Peters Digital Units of Work um, for this year's CBCA guide. So this is what your screen will look like. And everyone, regardless or not of whether you're a Peter member, has access to all of these sample texts here. And these samples are actually units based on one text from each of the categories. So I'll just have a click here and show you. And then hopefully this will help you to understand as well that rather complicated table I took you through. So each of the digital units are organized around literature and literacy. So as I said, you've got exploring the context of literature and examining lit literature down here. And I'm just circling those so you can see. And then of course we move on to the next tab and you've got responding to literature and creating literature, which again are those categories that I took you through um, on the last slide. And then finally in language, you've got text structure and cohesion, grammar and vocabulary, and visual and multimodal features. Now, um, each of the content descriptors 
each of, well, each of the activities is linked to a content descriptor from the Australian curriculum, and these are hyperlinked. So when you click on them, this will take you to the content descriptor um, actually on the Australian curriculum, curriculum website. Excuse me. And then also some of the resources that you might need are hyperlinked. So when you click on those, they'll come up, and it will also link you to um, the glossary that is found in the Australian curriculum and any other resources online that are relevant. A couple of other features I'd like to show you. When you scroll down, just at the bottom here, there are some additional resources. And um, it's good to note that a lot of the publishers produce their own resources for the text. Um, as a bit of a warning, they do vary in quality. Some of them are absolutely fantastic, but some of them take a bit of wading through. So um, the publisher's um, teaching notes are also linked to many of these um, units. And then just on the left here, of course, you've got hyperlinks to information about the illustrators and the authors, um, to the, uh, the publisher's website, and of course, a nice little synopsis along with the themes and the ages that it's suitable for. Okay, so we'll go back to the um, we'll go back to the, the presentation now. And um, just to let you know that those digital units of work, as I said, they're available. Those six samples are available for everyone to use and um, you know use in their classroom. If you're a PETA member, you've also got access to the full range of digital units. And if you're not a PETA member, there's going to be a payment gateway coming up very, very shortly where you'll be able to um, pay for access to the digital units as well. So um, everyone will be able to use those units in their classroom. Okay, so that was a brief introduction and overview to quality literature and multimodal text, the Australian curriculum, and of course PETA digital units of work. Now we get into the good stuff. Now we're going to take a closer look at some of the fantastic picture book texts in this year's CBCA shortlist. So for those of you who don't know, there are five main categories in the shortlist. There's older readers, and just to let you know that none of the texts today that we're looking at are from that category. The older readers category really is um, aimed at secondary and I would say middle to senior secondary students because some of the content um, can be quite mature, shall we say. Um, the younger readers text, the, sorry, the younger readers category, early childhood, picture books and information books. So those are the five categories that um, each year the CBCA shortlist the books into. So in this year's picture book category, we've got Dream of the Thylacine, which is... Um, I'll get my trusty little highlighter out here. So Dream of the Thing, which is the latest offering from Margaret Wilde and Ron Brooks, who um, obviously are quite famous for their fantastic text box. Um, we'll be looking at this text in detail later on, so I'm not going to talk any more about it. The next um, text that is shortlisted is No Bears. This is actually shortlisted in um, two categories, in the picture books and the early childhood. And it's a wonderful little text uh, about um, a little girl who wants to write a story that has absolutely no bears in it. Um, it's a fantastic text that references lots of common fairy tales. So there's some really wonderful intertextuality there. And um, it's a really, really great book for teaching the craft of narrative as well as, um, as, well as getting students to link, um, link this text into other texts that they may know. Four Creatures is essentially an extended poem, and it's kind of an, an ode to all of the creatures in the world, and it's very beautifully written and beautifully illustrated. And again, we'll be looking at um, some of the samples from Floral Creatures um, later. Flood, down here in the bottom left, it was written by Jackie French in response to the terrible um, Queensland floods that happened um, what, about a year and a half ago now. And um, all of the proceeds to this book are actually going to the, the Queensland Floods um, Fund. And the story really is about how the floods, um, even though they were an absolutely tragic thing, this amazing sense of community and togetherness um, was kind of came out of the flood. And, and the book sort of focuses on that. So it's, it's a really nice little text um, to talk about community and, and how people come together in disasters. A Bus Called Heaven, 
is the latest offering from Bob Graham. Again, this is a really strong community focus. It's about a little girl called Stella, who um, is rather shy. She's the colour of moonlight. And she um, one day finds an abandoned bus on her front lawn. And she takes it upon herself, along with some people from her community, to turn it into a community centre. Um, so that's a really, it, it's a beautifully written book. And again, we'll be looking at, at that today. And then finally, Look a Book by Libby Gleason and Freya Blackwood is um, another book that we're going to be looking at in, in great detail later on. So I won't be talking any more about that. We'll be looking at that later on. Okay, the next category. So early childhood, obviously, it all contains picture books as well. Um, we've got Come Down Cat, which is a lovely story about the relationship between a boy and his cat who have separate um, separate and very different fears. Nicholas is afraid of the dark and the cat is afraid of rain. And they both have to overcome their separate fears um, when Nicholas has to rescue the cat when a rainstorm starts at night. Of course, no bears, which we talked about in um, both categories. That's not a daffodil. Is um, a text that is a story about the relationship between a little boy and his neighbour who helps him to grow a daffodil. And it's a great text um, for a number of different reasons, but we're not going to talk about that again because you're going to be doing a bit of an activity on it later on. Rudy Nudy down here at the bottom is a story of bath time in the home. Now, the one thing I will say about this text is the kids are naked throughout all of it. So if you, um, you need to be perhaps culturally sensitive um, using this text, it kind of depends on your student population. Um, but again, it's a nice little kind of poem-based book with a strong sense of rhythm. The Runaway Hug is again a very, very um, kind of early childhood sort of kindergarten level theme and it's about the hug that gets carried away. So Lucy wants to have a hug from her mum and then she passes the hug on to all the members of her family. And again, it's a great great text to talk about family and some of those, um, some of those issues that, that really relate to kindergarten children. And finally, the last book um, in this category is The Last Viking. And this is a book about a little boy who's a bit frightened of quite a few things. Um, and he also has quite a strong fantasy world, and he decides he's going to become a Viking. Um, little bit known to him, the real Vikings in the sky in Valhalla get very excited about the fact that he's decided to become a Viking. And they, um, shall we say, intervene on his behalf when he's dealing with a bunch of rather nasty bullies, which, of course, helps him to gain his confidence again. Okay, and moving on to the final category that has picture books in it, the information text. Of course, the older readers and the younger readers um, categories don't have any picture books in them this year, so we're not talking about them in, um, in this webinar. Um, the only text that is not a picture book in this category is from L down here, and this text um, is essentially about World War One. So it's got some got some quite confronting content. It's a fantastic book, um, but we won't be talking about it today because, of course, it's, it's not a picture book text. So in this category, you've got the Little Refugee um, by the famous comedian Ando, who was actually um, a refugee after the Vietnam War. He was a Vietnamese boat person. And this is about his story of coming to Australia. And we're going to be looking at that in detail later on in the presentation. Bilby Secrets is an interesting hybrid text. It's a combination of a narrative and an information book about um, the endangered Bilby. And again, it's beautifully illustrated and quite cleverly written with both the narrative and the information um, text kind of interwoven. One Small Island is a text we're going to be looking at later on. So um, we'll talk about that later. And, and that's by Alison Lester and Coral Tullock. And it's about Macquarie Island. Playground is um, a text of it's a text that's compiled by Nadia Wheatley, and it's actually written around the oral histories of Indigenous um, Indigenous Australians, and um, we'll be looking at that quite a few times when we're looking at some of the cross-curricular themes. And then finally, Surrealism for Kids is by the Queensland Art Gallery, and it's a great little book on um, surrealist art, the artists who well the, the surrealist artists, and it's got some fantastic tips on how to create your own 
um, surrealist art. It's got some lovely procedural texts in there, as well as some um, some great descriptions about and, and, and biographies about the, the surrealist artists. So those are all of the texts, hopefully, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, they're all combined. I'm going to talk about them thematically, though, rather than through the categories. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more now. Okay, so for those of you who aren't aware, um, in the Australian curriculum, there are a few different ways that you can think about programming thematically. Um, obviously, you might want to link the, con the content of the English curriculum to the other curricula because, of course, we all know that we have to, um, we have to program cross in a cross-curricular manner in, in primary education because we've got such a crowded curriculum. So in the Australian curriculum history, as you can see, in foundation or kindergarten, you've got personal and family histories, year one, present and past family life. So there's a really strong family focus there in, in, the, early, in the early years. Then you're moving on to looking at the past and the present, so local history and heritage in year two. And again, that kind of links into the year three concept of community and remembrance. Year four is about first contact, so it's about um, the, um, the arrival of, of, of the British to Australia and the impact that had, of course, on Indigenous population. Um, and then year five is where we start looking at federation and the Australian colonies, and year six is um, Australia as a nation. Again, that's federation, but the Australian colonies is more the early years of the Australian colonies, whereas Australia as a nation is, is more sort of First World War and beyond. Um, the Australian curriculum geography is organized around place, space, and environment as the three main strands. So I'll be talking about some, some great links that some of these texts can make to, to those. And in the Australian curriculum science, um, this year the texts only really link into some of the concepts or, and, and, and themes in biolog biological sciences. So again, I'll be talking about when, when those links occur. And then, of course, you've got the cross-curriculum priorities, which are sustainability, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, and Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia. And whilst we're talking about those cross-curricular priorities, um, there is a resource that you can access um, for free through the PETA website called Global Words, and that is some fantastic literature, um, well, those are some fantastic literature-based units that really address the cross-curriculum priorities, and I know that the Little Refugee is one of the texts that is, um, is used in those units. So I'd really recommend jumping online through the PETA website and looking at those Global Words units. Okay, so that's a brief overview of um, the content in the other curriculum areas in, in the new Australian curricula. Now I'm going to talk about the themes that can be derived from, those, from, from that content. So the themes that we're going to be looking at today and we're going to be linking the picture books into are families and communities, which cover, of course, those kind of early years in history, and of course, some of the geography in a place, space, and environment. Time change continuity, including heritage traditions, uh, you know, the history of Australia, and again, that is mainly history, some elements of, of geography. Um, one of the really strong things that comes through that you can program with is, of course, cultures, including identity and cultural diversity. Um, and that is, of course, linking to both history and geography. And another really, really strong theme that comes through in this year's picture books are, is environments and um, places and spaces. And, of course, that is very clearly geography, but also some links to um, biological sciences. And then finally, um, another theme is social systems and structures. Um, now, we're not going to be looking at that too much today because they don't really come into the picture books, but it's just uh, something that you should be aware of is one of the ways that you can program thematically um, using the Australian English curricula. And, of course, the other thing that we need to keep in, in our minds are the um, general capabilities. And these are the ones that I've circled um, in red that actually do relate quite well to this year's picture book. You've, of course, got intercultural understanding, ethical behavior, personal and social capability, and critical and creative thinking. So kind of in the back of our minds, when I'm thinking about the themes that we can program around using these picture book texts, these capabilities interwoven into some of those themes. So it's quite a complicated um, model. 
Okay, so in a minute I'm going to switch back to those, those themes on that page. And I'm going to ask you to type a quick message in. How do you think that one of these, the themes that I talked about can link into something you're already doing in the classroom? So is there a unit of work that would link into one of these themes that you're already teaching? Is there something in your current state syllabi that um, link into these themes? Or do you just have an idea um, for a fantastic literature text that you're already using that might link into those themes? So um, if you could... Um, type in the answer there to the, you'll see that there's a poll that's appeared. You just type in a short answer into that poll box. Um, that'll just give us an, an, an idea of, of what you're thinking about and get you kind of thinking about how the themes can relate to what you're already doing so it's not going to be such a big jump to incorporate these, these picture books and the themes behind these picture books. So I'm just going to look across at my other screen and see what answers we're going to get. I can almost hear you thinking. Fantastic. So first, first cab off the rack. So Susan's talking about how it links into history and sustainability with what she's doing in the classroom, so that's great. I think I need more. So, Danielle, that's fine. If you need more time, not a problem. It's quite a big question to think about, isn't it? Oh, okay. So, lovely. There's Vicky talking about a unit of work. But I'm afraid we've had a bit of a technical problem. We can't quite expand the um, the poll box, so I'm afraid I can't read the unit of work you're doing, Vicky. Um, if you'd be kind enough to type it in the message box on the bottom right hand there, that would be great. Because unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, we can't actually see the unit of work that you're talking about. Okay. We'll just wait another few seconds just to see if there's anyone else. All right. Okay, so hopefully um, a unit of work in the past. Well, thank you very much, Vicky. That's great. Much appreciated. So hopefully um, you've got some ideas as to how these themes that I've been talking about that, that link the new Australian curricula can also link to what you're doing in your classroom. And then, of course, I'm going to take you through how this year's picture book text will link into those themes and into what you're already doing in the classroom. Okay. So the first theme we're going to be looking at is past heritage and tradition. And I'm just going to need to switch screens to show you some of the text there. So just bear with me whilst we're switching screens. Okay, so past heritage, I can't, ah. okay, um, so past heritage and tradition here, the first text that we're looking at is um, from One Small Island, which is of course about the history of Macquarie Island. And as you can see immediately, there are some fantastic visual links to concepts of, um, of the past. You've got um, over in the top left there, you're looking at um, a whole um, list of how many casks of, of um, seal and whale oil the early whalers um, made. And of course, you've got this fantastic old-fashioned font um, on this background of, of the, the very kind of aged visual paper, along with that pen and ink concept. So you can immediately see that um, the author and illustrator have worked really hard to build in that concept of past to the visual text. And the great thing about this text is that because, the, because it's about a history of Macquarie Island, it's, um, it kind of moves through time. So it's structured um, chronologically. And of course, now you're moving 
forward in time to 1892, the last one was 1820, and you can see that there's some fantastic visual elements of um, that little advert there for the, for the um, elephant, sea elephant oil. Um, again, you've got that older font, but it's changed slightly, and you've still got the pen and ink drawing there. Um, and of course, at the bottom, as you can see, there's um, a wonderful narrative going on as well about um, about the experiences of um, the early settlers on the island, both positive and negative, and of course the impact that they had on on the island. So, the Macquarie Island has a very um, a very rich and complex past, and this text um, visually does a great job of kind of pulling that complexity together in, in quite a visual way. Moving on, the next um, text that talks about past heritage and tradition is um, Playground, which is, of course, compiled by Nadia Wheatley. Now, Playground's organized around a series of topics, um, and the big idea behind the text is really that for indigenous people, um, the whole of their world is both a school and a playground. It's a place to live and learn and share and explore, whereas, of course, in, um, in Anglo or, um, you know, Australian culture, um, people only learn within a school, and the playground is just for playing. Now, at the beginning of each of the um, of the sections, you've got a wonderful um, a wonderful introduction to um, some of the indigenous perspectives on on the topic, and then, as you can see, you've got nice little um, illustrations that kind of go with that. And then, as you go through, you move on to the oral histories. So each section has got a little introduction to the person who's, who's um, providing the oral history. And then, of course, you've got um, the text itself. And again, visually, you've got all these lovely little elements of, the, um, of some of the... Here you've obviously got some of the, um, the animals that, that were fished for, and you've got that wonderful picture of, um, of that child going spearfishing. And then, of course, you've got the, the family um, on their way on, on a fishing excursion as well. So there's all sorts of kind of interesting um, little visual elements to play around, as well as the um, just incredible oral narratives. Again, you can see here in Playground there is just a nice little map that goes with oral narratives. So you can see there's all sorts of all sorts of different visual elements going on in this text that really um, illustrate and accompany the oral oral history. Okay, moving on to the last text that talks about past heritage and tradition. And this one is, of course, the um, Little Refugee. And it talks, the Little Refugee talks um, about Ando's life in, in three main sections. The first section is his life in Vietnam. The second section is his um, journey to Australia. And the third section is his, um, I guess, his struggle to, um, to grow up in, in such a different culture. So as you can see, there's great um, pen and ink drawings here that take you back to Vietnam and to Ando's past. And of course, that touch on the, the Vietnam War. Um, we'll talk a lot more about the visual literacy of this text when we go into it in detail. Um, again, you've got the um, the history here of the Vietnamese boat people, and um, obviously the the past and the heritage of of migration to Australia. Okay, so now we're going to go and look at the um, next topic. So we're going to switch screens again, and we're going to look at um, family. So just bear with us whilst we um, switch the screen to the texts that talk about family. We're just going straight to the PDF here. Sorry, just chatting to my technician. And um, obviously the theme of family is perhaps more closely aligned with um, some of the some of the topics and um, and curriculum content from the early years um, and so obviously the text kind of reflect that so the first text we're looking at here is the runaway hug and as I mentioned this is about a little girl called Lucy um, who um, gets a hug from her mum and as you can see visually this is lovely kind of um, sort of pen and watercolor quite simple images with just kind of very chosen little bits of colour to kind of really draw your, your eye to certain aspects of the text. Um, and I think it would be really, really visually appealing for, for the younger, um, younger readers. So in this text, 
it really links into family because this is about Lucy's family and her understanding of family. Obviously, you know, in the modern context, families can look very, very different, and it's important to remember that. Um, but this is here, Lucy starting to pass the hug on to her dad. And then she gives it to her little sister, Lily, the baby. Oops, we'll go. And, and it keeps on going around, and the, the dog gets a hug, and then eventually the hug comes back to Lucy. So as you can see, there's a really, really strong theme of family running throughout the, those images that I've just shown you there. And it's a great opportunity for get, um, to get younger children talking about their own families and, um, you know, perhaps passing their own hug through their own, um, to their own kind of family structure. And, um, yeah, just teaching the concept of a family structure and how every family can look a little bit different. Okay, Rudy Nudy. Again, from the perspective of family, you've got uh, Rudy Nudy and her younger sibling and mum in the bath. And as you can see, it's kind of got that poetic, um, quite rhythmic um, text that accompanies it. So I'm just, there's only just a, a couple of pages from each of these texts, just to give you an idea of how the themes are linking into the, the text. So of course you've got them jumping around the house after their bath, all kind of excited, having a nice time together. And then finally going to bed and um, settling in for the night. Again, from a family perspective, it's a great opportunity to um, talk about what family looks like for, for these people. But again, um, with that little cultural warning in there, um, not all um, students will quite necessarily understand the, the naked children running around. Okay, and moving on to playground. Um, obviously, there's a very, very strong sense of, of family in this text. Um, and this is one of the only texts that really would um, translate across to the older generation, um, sorry, the older, um, the older students. Family in this context as well, it's important to talk about, is not just, um, I guess, the nuclear family that we talk about, but also family in terms of um, skin groups. It talks about in this introduction the skin system in um, Aboriginal culture. And um, it's a really, really great way to, um, to get students to understand that concepts of family can change from culture to culture. Um, so as you can see here, you've got the introduction, and then it talks about um, the story of this carpet snake and um, talks about the skin system behind the family um, in, in this particular um, Aboriginal group of people. And then, of course, you've got some wonderful art to accompany it and um, these nice little images of, of the bird and the cutout. So as you can see, there's quite a lot going on in the playground text that really broadens that concept of family. And again, there's um, photographic um, evidence here. I mean, this was from, this was taken in 1952, this image. And um, again, it's a really interesting sort of take on what is family and um, how family or the concept of family can apply to, um, to different cultures and different groups of people. And of course here, just a little story, um, again, about family. It moves into concepts of, of family from um, moving away from that broader concept of skin into that sort of closer um, concept of, of people living together in, in, uh, under one roof. And so there's some nice little oral histories here. Um, about those stories. Okay, so the next theme we're going to be looking at is identity and personal and social capability. So it's quite a mouthful. Um, what we're talking about there is really concepts of identity in terms of you know, who, who are you as a person, um, what makes up your identity, which is again a very, very strong theme that runs through those younger years. But then I've included personal and social capability, which is of course one of the new Australian um, general capabilities because it links in really well with that identity. And again, these texts sort of help younger children to build up concepts of self and explore who they are. Okay, so the first text we're looking at is um, Come Down Cat. And as I mentioned, this is about Nicholas and his cat, and they both have um, separate and quite different fears. So Nicholas is saying down here, ghosts and monsters and creepy crawlies come out at night. Won't you be frightened, cat? So really what we're talking about, of course, is Nicholas's fears. And then Nicholas continues to think about 
all of the awful things that come out in the night. So he's obviously quite afraid of the dark. Um, now the cat, on the other hand, is scared of the rain. So, and this is interesting. It, it, it's a great um, way of talking about how sometimes situations can cause you to forget your fears and find new things in yourself. So Nicholas discovered a level of bravery that he didn't think possible when his, his love for his cat forced him to go outside in the dark with all the monsters and the scary creepy crawlies to rescue his cat. And of course he's thinking about the cat being very brave, but of course Nicholas, you know, in terms of his identity, he's thinking about being really brave. And um, again, if you think at the visual elements, we'll just scroll back here. As you can see visually, um, there's some really kind of strong um, composition going on. There's some fantastic levels where you're kind of you're looking up at this big scary house, which helps you to think about um, how frightening it must be for Nicholas and the cat. And then you've got all these big um, shadows from all of the scary creepy crawlies with the gaze looking all the way down and being quite um, salient in the image there so that, again, you can kind of understand Nicholas's fear. So um, from the perspective of teaching visual literacy as well as teaching um, sort of stories about identity and finding yourself, this is, another, this is a great text. Again, you've got that angle looking down. And then, of course, you've got that close-up of Nicholas there. Okay, and this is moving on to um, The Last Viking. And, of course, from this perspective, it's quite similar in, in the fact that the main character, like Nicholas, um, Josh, the main character, is a little bit frightened of a few things, um, even though it says he's very brave. Um, he's not afraid of anyone or anything, except maybe the dark, and the sound of ghosts whistling in the trees at night. Pirates worry him a bit, of course, and so do boy-eating dinosaurs and monsters under the bed. He's also just a little afraid of dragons and vampires. But other than those few things, Josh is as brave as a lion, sort of. So it's a great little introduction there to, um, you know, concepts that children might have about um, about themselves and what their strengths and, and, and their weaknesses are and what their kind of fears and their hopes are, which, of course, links in very strongly to identity. And, um, of course, what happens here is that um, Josh, this rather unpleasant group of bullies who... Um, who um, aren't particularly nice to him, as you can see, they tie him up to a tree, and um, it doesn't work out so well for him. And this is, of course, and then you've got this lovely kind of cartoon strip style series of pictures where um, you don't, it doesn't actually say that Josh is being bullied, um, and that quote at the top comes from actually the Vikings who are watching Josh from Valhalla, they think they're saying we must keep watch and see if he really does have the courage of his heroic ancestors. Um, of course, he, at the moment, he, um, he doesn't because he's, he's been beaten up by these nasty bullies. And this visual um, story says um, everything. And then, of course, Josh, who is being his Viking self, has to confront the bullies. And you've got some wonderful visual literacy here of this kind of image as if you are the Vikings looking down on the bullies. And, of course, Josh isn't aware of these, these Vikings behind him. As you can see, he's, um, he's just offering his gaze over there to the bullies, who are then, of course, looking up at these ravens. And what's behind the ravens is, um, are, are, of course, the Vikings. And this is a great... Um, and, of course, this, this situation where Josh manages to beat off these bullies gives him the confidence in himself to, um, to kind of go back home and, and feel strong and brave and kind of... Um, yeah, just kind of develop and enhance his, his identity and his sense of self as he grows up. And of course, the last text that links into concepts of identity and personal and social capability is again Playground. And we've talked a lot about Playground already and talked about family. And as you can see, um, there are really strong themes here about um, concepts of identity for Aboriginal, um, for Aboriginal people and how their identity it's not just their name, it's their, their skin system and their family group around them. So again, it's a really um, great link into those bigger ideas about identity um, that, that lead on from, from early childhood and kind of kindergarten and year one to those more um, complex understandings of identity in terms of who you are as a member of your, your, your culture and, and your wider society. 
Okay, so the next theme we're going to be looking at is communities and cultures. And um, the texts, of course, in, in this that link in really well are Flood, and we're going to have a little look at that one now. So this is a scene from Flood. Um, now, what's great about Flood is the whole way that it is um, written and illustrated is almost like a flood has kind of come over the page. You can see there's lots, lots of sort of drips of paint all the way through, and it's got that wonderful, uh, wonderful sense of kind of a deluge running through the book, as well as um, these kind of almost sketched images um, that, again, have a a sense of things kind of being washed away and, and hastily brought together, which of course is one of the underlying themes of, of the text. Now in terms of communities and cultures, obviously this is about people coming together, community coming together to overcome disaster. And there are some wonderful visual images of people working together. And one of the great things um, about this text visually, as, as you go through and read it, is that you, um, you tend to feel like you're a part of this, this fantastic group of people who are helping. So you can see here they are um, helping clean things out. Strangers offered shelter, and again, you're part of this little circle, these group of people offering shelter. And the kindness of strangers bloomed like flowers after rain. Tens of thousands cleaned and mended, roaming the streets with mops and shovels, baskets of apples, sweet fresh water and plates of cakes. So again, you know, the gaze in all of these images is not, um, is not directed out at you, it's not demanding of you, and which makes you kind of step into the text, step into the story and feel like you're a part of it. The next text that links in really well to this theme of communities and cultures is, of course, a bus called Heaven. One of the interesting um, readings, of, or visual readings of this text is that the text itself doesn't talk about um, diversity and difference in, in, in an inner city community in terms of the words, but the images um, say it all. As you can see here, you know, you've got everyone from a biker to a rabbi through to a, a Christian priest. You've got mums and kids and um, people from all kinds of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds that come together through this, um, through this wonderful community center. And as you go through, you can start to see how the bus actually draws people together and becomes a visual focus for things. Um, as you can see here again, you've got these visual images of the community kind of working all together that tell another level of, of people coming together that is not actually um, narrated in, in the actual writing. And you've got this wonderful image looking down on the bus in its first day as a community centre. And again, you can see that sense of community and those diversity of cultures included in, in the bus, which um, it's a really nice image to get children thinking about how people can come together and share their similarities rather than talk about their differences. And of course, um, again, Playground obviously links in thematically so well to, to quite a lot of these different themes. Um, I won't talk about it too much again because we've already looked at that and I'm sure you can guess how it talks about community and culture. Okay, the next theme we're going to be looking at is environment and sustainability and this is quite a big one. Um, so we're going to switch to that screen now. And there's actually, I think, five or six texts that talk about environment and sustainability. And um, obviously this is also a theme that links in really well to geography and biological sciences. So the first text that we're looking at is Bilby Secrets. And what's interesting about this text is that um, the words never actually talk about the habitat of the Bilby. The entire habitat of the Bilby and the entire reader's understanding of the habitat is constructed solely through the images. Um, so again, it makes a really quite interesting reading of this text. Um, obviously, Bilby Secrets um, is about the endangered Bilby. The text talks about, essentially, it is structured around the life cycle of a Bilby, but like I said, it's written from the perspective of an information report where you can see here, Bilbies have sharp teeth as they hunt, they store food in their cheeks. But it's also written from the perspective of a narrative. I don't think I've got, no, I don't actually have um, one of the narrative um, sections here. But when, when you have a look at the text and go away and read it, you'll see that um, it's quite an interesting, interesting interpretation of what is really an, an informational text. And like I say, those images um, 
as well as supporting the content of the text, also open up a whole new area of content about the environment of, of, of the Western Desert. Okay, so one small island about Macquarie Island, obviously really big environment and state sustainability focus because, of course, what happened to the island is that the whalers and the sealers who came, the settlers who came, completely destroyed the um, native wildlife of, of the island. It's got a very unique um, flora and, and fauna and a unique um, environmental heritage. And um, the story essentially is about the struggle that modern-day scientists have had to try and restore the island to its, its um, pre-settlement um, state. And as the text moves on, you can sort of see visually you've got these, these wonderful images of, of the native wildlife, but then you've got that little image of the, um, of the boat in the background, which, of course, your gaze is kind of is drawn to there and, and makes you think, hmm, what's going to happen here? And then, of course, the, um, the whalers and the, the sealers come. And, of course, you can see the bloodbath that starts to happen. Again, the, the visual images in One Small Island are very, very strong. They kind of, um, they certainly aren't um, objective, shall we say. They're a very subjective um, reading of, of, of what happened and obviously the kind of the horror of, of what happened to the island and, and its wildlife. Okay, so moving on, the next, um, the next text that links in really well to this concept of environment and sustainability is For All Creatures. And as you can see, um, this one, this particular page is about spiders. And you've got that wonderful poetic language, um, which I said is almost reads like an ode. For weavers and wisps, for silk spinners and spiderlings, lace and loveliness, and for webs, we are thankful. And each page of this deals with a different, um, a different animal, even if it deals with humans later on, and has this fantastic combination of technical vocabulary around the concept and then these brilliant kind of collage style images that um, that illustrate some of the, the features and the characteristics of the animal. So you're really looking at a kind of a semi-hybrid text with um, a poem and also um, information um, that is kind of, again, overlaid with these beautiful visual images. So again, here you can see you've got butterflies and it talks about chrysalis and camouflage and um, metamorphosis. And then you've got, again, the beautiful painting and, and the collage that, that goes with it. Um, you know, obviously, for, for the younger children especially, this is a great, um, a great model for some, some visual, um, for some drawing and some art that they could create and some visual pages and posters that they could create about their own animal, which, of course, would be then matched with some of the technical language in this poetic ode form. And, of course, flood um, links in very well to the concept of environment. Obviously, um, natural disasters, um, talking about Australia as, as, a, as a drought-stricken land and, and as a land that, that is prone to some terrible natural disasters, um, and the cycle of wet and dry that, of course, happens. Um, again, you can see visually there's that kind of that concept of there being too much water, too much rain, and almost so much that it's overwhelming the page itself. And, um, of course, in the beginning, it, it describes what happens in, in the floods and then, of course, the, the aftermath. Um, moving on, the dream of the thylacine, which we're going to be looking at in detail in a minute, um, is um, very much about, obviously, sustainability and the environment in the sense that it, it discusses the, um, the thylacine, which, of course, became extinct in, in the late 20s, early 30s. And, again, we won't go into that because we're going to be looking at that in a minute. And that's not a daffodil. Um, this links into the environment, of course, because it's about the life cycle of a daffodil. And it also links in really well to ideas of, of um, growing, what do living things need, again, at that kind of early childhood level. Okay, so now we're going to move on to look at four texts in detail. And we're going to um, start off with um, the dream of the thylacine. Um, and we're actually going to read the whole text there, and I'm going to draw your attention to some of the fantastic visual features in this book. And, of course, um, we talked about how it already links into um, to, um, environment sustainability and also into some areas because it's a very creative text um, and a very poetic text. Okay, so um, here we go, Dream of the Thylacine. Um, 
I don't know if any of you can you just um, message me have you read this text yet can you just write a yes or a no to message me please so I can see whether or not I need to go through it no no okay all right so two no's so we might as well start reading so as you can see on this first page here I'll go back you've got this wonderful um, collage this visual image of the um, of the thylacine behind this chicken wire here that immediately sets up this image of this animal and it's quite faded and um, and indistinct and again um, with these kind of wooden bars so it immediately sets up the image for you can't see you can't see the book okay is anyone else not able to see the image on their screen you can let me know if you can say I can't see the image um, you should be able to hopefully um, okay so anyway we'll, we'll move on and if no one said they can't see it so far so um, <laughs> I've seen someone said love there I'm hoping that Vicky's loving that loving the book the dream of the thylacine okay so um, the text is organized into three main sections and um, each section is um, kind of framed by this poetic language so trapped am I in cage of twisty wire cold concrete prowl rage howl know you not that I am tooth and claw see me hunt through bracken and bush See me swagger across wild lands. See me glory at the edge of a cliff. So in each of these, um, I guess, frames for the beginning of, of the visual images, you've got this really rich, dense language um, presented in this font that almost looks like um, the kind of um, chopped up newspaper font that you might do like a death note in, which is quite an interesting visual idea. Um, again, and, and it, it's that background is of those wooden um, planks that surround the cage. So again, you've got these really strong visual images of, um, of the animal being trapped. And then you go on, and there's no words um, after these, these main section introductions, just images. So visually, you've got the image of the thylacine swaggering and prowling through the bush, and his gaze takes you onwards, always onwards through the bush to the next page. You've got these wonderful stunning backgrounds of the Tasmanian um, the Tasmanian wilderness. And again you see he's getting you to look back here, looking back at where he's just come from. And it really gets you, the reading path kind of enables you to follow and really explore the pages um, and, and and the context of the habitat very well. And then, of course, you see him howling at the edge of the cliff, this stunning kind of image of freedom. And um, I guess it's slightly mournful as well, which kind of cues in really well to the next section. And, of course, you've now got him looking even more faded. He's looking quite sad and forlorn. In the other one, in the first picture, he was kind of pacing. Now he's stopped and he's looking down. And, again, it, it kind of represents that sense of, of, the, of the thylacine disappearing um, as we go through the book. So the next section, ailing am I, in cage of twisty wire, cold concrete, mourn, ache, yearn. Know you not that my heart is a forest. Run with me through trees of strictly bark. Run with me over creeks of flickering fish. Run with me where the snow falls slow. So again, you get to run with him through the bush, exploring these fantastic um, vistas and, and scenes where he's free and alone and, and running running wild. I mean the pictures say it all they are absolutely stunning as you can see. And of course there's him through the snow. You get that wonderful sense of silence from the image as well. You know, the sense that that the thylacine is, is on his own, that he is the last one, he is the only one left. And especially, you know, when you start to cue into these images where you just have the snow and his own paw prints and nothing else in the background. And then, of course, in this third final section here, 
he's very, very faint. He's very, very indistinct. It's almost like he's gone. And he's a shadow. Shadow am I, in cage of twisty wire, cold concrete, thin, still, mute. Know they not that my spirit flies free, seeking the mouth of the river, the arms of the mountain. So now you get this sense that the, that the thylacine is starting to detach from his world, to go into a, a dreamlike sense. And, of course, that is um, visually represented by the bird's eye perspective that we're kind of switching into. So it looks like almost um, it's his spirit that's flying now. He's leaving his body. He's, he's um, moving away from this beautiful cage that he's trapped in, from these memories that he's had, and, and moving perhaps to the next life or um, to this concept of extinction. So as you can see, he's um, flying through here, the mouth of the river and the arms of the mountain. You've got that rainbow, which is quite of an ironic symbol of hope, really, considering the situation that he's in, that he is the last thylacine. And now this wonderful change of font and background rests now. Hear the stones chant, the wind console. Just on that white background, very, very powerful. And you see him here, in terms of mood and color, you've got sunset indicating end of days. He's yawning. It's kind of like he's tired of this life. He's tired of, of this, this concrete and this, this um, area he's trapped in, and he's ready for ready to be released, ready to be, I guess, spiritually freed. And then you've got dreaming am I. And then finally he becomes, he becomes the bush here. You can see that he actually becomes the stones. He kind of um, becomes a part of the Tasmanian bush, like a memory in the bush. As you can see, it's an absolutely um, fantastic, um, I guess, an ode to this beautiful lost animal. It's a really complex text, that, um, both visually and, um, and verbally, um, will, will stand a lot of readings. There's a lot that um, students can get out of the images, as you can see, and of course it links in very strongly to that theme of sustainability. Okay, we will move on. Um, because we started a little bit later, we will um, go to about 7.20 um, Eastern Time or 5.20 um, uh, Western Time, just to let you know. Um, okay, so we're going to be looking next at Look a Book, which is a really interesting text that I personally, when I first read it, um, I didn't actually get it the first time, and I think that's always a hallmark of, uh, of a really interesting text. And I think you might see um, why as we go through it. So Look A Book is essentially um, the actual words in Look A Book, the actual narrative, is, is quite brief. Um, and really it's talking about, oh, look, these, these children, they find a book, um, they have to take care of it. And that's really what the narrative says. But the images say something completely different, and this is why it's such an interesting reading. So as you can see, the children are um, in this kind of fairly you know, rough background. You've got junk in the yard, you've got the chooks, you've got the wobbly fence, and these children who are barefoot, um, you know, walking through, walking through, and again, you've got the sofa outside, and all these kind of hallmarks of, of um, I guess, a sort of um, lower socioeconomic kind of outback, um, rural style style life. The shopping trolley. And as you can see, so the first three pages, no text at all. And then fourth page, look, a book, and the children find this, this book. And then what happens is, as they find this book, the images start to change. You see, you notice you've got a white background now, and um, you've got, you know, the abandoned car. But the white background is indicative of a change that's happening, and you'll see the change that happens as the children pick up the book. So they've picked up the book, and they're climbing on top of either the dunny or the shed. I don't know what it is. Um, and they're about to read the book. And again, that background is white. And as you can see, it chops forward so that they're in the foreground, and... They're looking at the book. And now you can see the page is framed as if it is actually a book. And you've got this sense of them being on top of the outhouse there. But then you've got the word, don't leave it. So really, the only text you've had so far is, look, a book, don't leave it. Um, and then, of course, don't leave it where the dust will blow on it. And then really what starts to happen is that the book takes them into this incredibly rich imaginary world where 
they find all of these things happening to them. So the dust has, is blowing and they've made a little sail out of the tin from the roof and they're flying over telegraph poles which have become washing lines. And then of course you go back and you can see this book down here at the bottom which the dog has found. And then of course the, um, the shopping trolleys have become cages for the chooks in their imagination as they're flying over this rich world which they've gone into when they're reading the text. And again, so don't leave it where the dust will blow on it, where the dog will chew on it. So this is also a kind of um, an explanation as to why you should care for a text. You know, I read it, first of all, from a librarian perspective, thinking this is a great way to get kids to think about how to look after books when they first come to the library. Um, don't leave it where the rain will fall on it. And then, of course, the rain's falling and it's filling up and they're going into this imaginary world where they turn the teacup into a boat and they float over, the book floats down to the bottom of this, this flooded world with all the rubbish, and the children can look back down, and oh, look, there's a bunny, it's fallen down, and everything's kind of weird sizes, and again, it just indicates that they're traveling in this incredibly rich um, imaginary world. So sorry, Danielle still can't see. Um, okay, well, we'll have to, I'm sorry about that, Danielle, I do apologize. Um, okay, and the children are, of course, um, swimming down there to find the book again. And then, of course, it switches out. You can see here you've got the edge of this page, which, again, indicates that we're switching back into this reality of the children who have found the book. And so, of course, what, now that they've found this book and they've understood that it can unleash their imaginations and let them fly, fly free from this, this um, you know, fairly impoverished world in which they're living, um, they understand they need to hold it close and free from all the dust and the dog and the rain. And then they can read it again and again and again. So as you can see, visually, um, there's loads going on. It's, it's a really interesting text, um, text to read that kind of encompasses both the concept of imagination and the concept of caring for a book. You know, you've got this storyline going on in the background about these kids that really don't have a lot in their life, but um, something as simple as finding a book, um, you know, unleashes and releases them really into a world of imagination. You know, it's quite an interesting, um, an interesting comment on how education and reading can can change your world. And then, of course, it's also about creativity and imagination and what reading can do for you. So, um, and as you can see here, they're flying through this this fantastic city of, of rubbish on their coat can. Okay, um, now, it's your turn. Um, you, so you can see again and again anyway. Um, if you can open up um, the um, folder, the, the, the file, there was a hyperlink that um, was sent to you at the beginning of the, um, of the presentation, and I might just get I might just pop that up again, and um, it's of a double page spread of that sort of daffodil, and you'll see it coming up on your screen in a minute, even if you can't open it yourself. Um, so this is the activity that I'm just going to ask you to, um, to do from home. And so what I'd like you to do is um, I'd like you to have a look at this image and have a think about what aspects of the image you focus on in visual literacy, in terms of visual literacy. So if you can just type what you would focus on, would you look at their gaze, would you look at the reading path, um, would you look at what's in the foreground or the background, would you look at um, the way excuse me, the image is composed. So if you can just write that in your message box, what immediately strikes you when you look at that double page spread. And then once you've done that, I'd like you to have a little think about one short activity you could do with the extract. Um, to scaffold students in a multimodal reading. So, of course, in those last two texts we were looking at, we were looking at how um, you could combine the actual words with the images to create a new and, and richer reading. Um, you know, if you just read the words or just read the images from the Dream of the, of the Thylacine or Look a Book, you'd have two very, very different texts, whereas really you have to read both language and image together to get that rich, dense, multimodal reading. So how would you help the students in this context to do the multimodal reading. So great, you've got Lauren saying, look at where they're looking, absolutely. So there's a really great 
little reading path there from the eyes of the um, the crow or the uh, I don't know the magpie or whatever I'm not quite sure what bird it is actually the blackbird even um, to Mr. Yilmaz down to Tom. Great. So the male is close to the child observing the daffodil. Great. Yeah. And again, that kind of in, uh, indicates that closeness indicates the relationship that they have, which is quite close and is becoming closer because of the daffodil. And also think about um, what you would do to scaffold students in a multimodal reading. So what would you focus on? What activity you could, could you do just based on this one page? Great. So um, Susan's thinking about what's important in the illustration. Good. What does your eye see first? What is the most salient image? Comparing the ages and what they do see. So Vicky, okay, yeah, nice. I thought about that one actually. Um, yeah, that's lovely actually. And how, yeah, and how the age of, of a person and I guess that 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 world filter that they have actually changes what they can see in in an image. That's a really really interesting reading. <laughs> Good. Why is the bird there? Well, that's as you read the book, the bird actually appears. Um, throughout the text, and there's also some little cards that appear as well. Personally, I think it's one of those really nice little devices that authors and illustrators pop into a text to get children to um, to see sort of reoccurring images that come through the text. Um, the bird doesn't play, play a key function necessarily, um, but the kids, I think, would really like to, to, to notice the bird as they're reading through it. Excellent. So... You've got Susan there saying, is the plant really a hand? Great. So, of course, you're introducing the concept of metaphor to children. And this is an excellent page for teaching ideas of, of metaphor. And little Tom saying it's a hand with five flat fingers and green fingers, Mr. Yomaz is saying. And, of course, really, it's a daffodil in its, in its budding stage. So you've got Lauren, show students just the part of the picture with a daffodil. Great. And ask the students what it is. Then show the whole picture and ask again and read the text and ask again. Great, that's wonderful. So again, um, getting children to think about how, how plants can change as they grow and how images might be different to represent those plants. And Susan again saying, having green fingers nice and being a gardener. Yeah, so you've got that, that idiom of, of, um, of having green fingers and what that means in our culture and as a saying. And of course, again, um, linking in really well to, um, to something you might be doing with growing in the garden um, or a unit on gardening. So again, Vicky thinking about why Mr. Yilmaz is leaning down. That's great. And what function him leaning and, and the angle of him leaning can um, does to draw your eye into Tom and into the daffodil as well. Good question. Is this in Australia? Um, yeah. Interesting. Be interesting to see what what your students would think about that, whether it is an Australian text or not, and why. Um, personally, I think it is an Australian text. Um, all of the texts that are shortlisted um, in the CBCA um, shortlist are by Australian authors. Um, but again, it's got that interesting multicultural perspective. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for um, doing a little bit of a, an activity there and joining us. Sorry, Vicky. What will Tom see in the next few weeks? Great prediction exercise. For those of you who know about focus on reading, um, you know, predicting is one of the key skills um, to, to um, developing your, your, your comprehension. And, um, of course, you can help to predict then from that page what he's going to see and also the metaphors that he might be talking about as well. Okay, we might move on because we are running out of time there. Um, we've got two more texts to look at, two more picture books, and we're going to look at one small island. Now, we have had quite a look at that already um, in um, the, um, the PowerPoint, of course. Um, we have had quite a look at that in the, um, in the themes, so we probably won't spend too much time, um, but we'll just go through visually some of the features that you can draw your attention to. Now, one small island is also, I haven't got the whole text here. You'll have to excuse this first page. I scanned it in rather badly. Um, you've got essentially two, again, two or three um, readings going on within the same text 
here. You've got the narrative at the bottom, um, which again is not um, not quite an objective narrator. Um, the narrator is quite sub subjective in her terms, in her choice of language. And again, that's a really interesting thing to analyze with, with your students. But visually, you've also got um, a number of different elements going on. So you've got the island here. And you're, it's like almost you're becoming the girl and you're flying into the island and you understand immediately that this is quite an isolated place. Um, and because it's isolated, it helps you to understand that it's quite special. Um, again, there's some sort of factual text here as well as the description. So you've got the way that the island was born, the actual geography of, of you know, um, tectonic plates and volcanoes. You've got a great description of some of the, um, the features here. And then, of course, you've got the image we've looked at already about the plants and the animals. So as you can see, visually, there's lots of things different, there's lots of different things going on. There's your kind of your classic narrative, your, um, which is really telling the story with words and images of what happened. You've then got um, more of a factual recount situation. You've got explanations and you've got information reports as well. And all of those visually um, are cued in by um, lots of different features, and you'll see what I'm talking about as we go through the text. Again, you've got this kind of recount story here, which we've looked at. And then, of course, now you've got this older font, the older paper, like um, I, I alluded to in the past um, heritage and tradition um, theme section. And now, of course, you've got this great, and I'll just draw your attention to the, um, the cat here. You've got this wonderful cat peeking um, in the foliage. And really, it's a great little way in to how something that looks so cute could really be so harmful um, because, of course, it's, it's the, um, the wildlife that was introduced onto the island which completely destroyed the native wildlife. Um, so again, visually, that's a really nice little image there. And then, of course, you've got the pages which describe the island's history as you go through. And at each seg segment or section in history, the font and the format and the layout all change. So here you're looking at um, images from 1948, and you've got this lovely little cue of the photo corners, which makes you think of an old-fashioned photo album. You know, you can imagine your granddad taking you through this photo album. Um, the font has again changed, and the images look more like sketched black and white photos than actual pen and ink drawings. And then you come through. Oh, one of the things to draw your attention to as well is that um, this wonderful um, color that comes throughout the text that's on the, um, the front cover and comes throughout the text is actually the um, aurora australis. And that is, of course, the, the southern lights, the phenomenon that happens in um, Arctic and subantarctic um, regions. In winter, with with the kind of the amazing atmospheric conditions that lead to these incredible lights, and so visually in the background you've got this going on, um, you've got this this going on that kind of helps you to to realise that this is a really special, unique place because this phenomenon doesn't happen in many places. Okay, um, so just a quick question for Lauren there. I'll just jump across. She said, which book was it that referred to indigenous skin groups? That was Playground by Nadia Wheatley. Okay, so um, moving on to this wilderness that existed perfectly under southern skies, you can see that the author and illustrator um, has worked really hard to talk about how special this island is, which then again contrasts with the horror that's kind of happened to the native wildlife. Um, again, you're moving forward here, and you've got 1980, so you've got this spiral bound... Oops, I'll just my pen, you've got this spiral bound element that makes you think of kind of writing letters and love letters back from the 80s. And um, again, the font has changed. And um, these are just really nice visual cues to show how, um, how the text is, is moving chronologically forwards. And again, it's dipping in and out of these, um, these lovely um, images of the island's wildlife. And of course, moving to more modern day here, you've got October 2010, and you've got um, a great little hybrid here of what almost looks like photos and pen and ink sketches with someone's um, writing 
they've written a diary, and of course at the bottom you've got the um, this continuing kind of recount narrative style, which as you can see, I mean, endless days of wind and cloud limited the program. I mean, endless days of wind and cloud is, is a very literary way of describing um, bad weather. And that's what's interesting about this text. You know, even though it's an information text, there's a lot going on. Okay. And then finally, um, you've got this lovely kind of coda at the end, which is about how Macquarie Islands is a, t a tiny part of our big world, but it's important to care for our precious places, no matter how small or far away they are. So again, you can see that visually, there's a lot going on in this text that's going to stand up to a lot of readings. Um, and of course, if we can save one small island, we can perhaps we can save them all, which is a nice environmental message. And now the last text that we're going to very briefly look at is um, The Little Refugee. Thank you for bearing with me. I know we're just slightly going over time. Um, we'll whiz through this one quickly, but it's a wonderful book, and it's got some great visual elements. So um, hopefully you, you won't mind hanging on for five extra minutes. So and there, of course, we've already looked at this image of him on, on the, uh, the the bicycle here. And what's interesting about this text is that the sections um, where he's talking about his life in Vietnam um, are all in this kind of sepia color, which is, um, again, a really great kind of mood and visual cue into memory and ideas of, of memory. You know, you can see you've got the black and the white and the yellows, and that's about it. Again, you've got that lovely um, image of his family where it looks almost like you're a part of the family circle and you're playing the game. And it makes you, it makes you connect emotionally with, with him as an author, kind of connecting back to his experience of, of, of his heritage and his family. Then the image changes and we go to more straight black and white as we move to, we cue into the Vietnam War and to the part of the story where he's on the pirate ship. So again, there's this really nice little kind of color and mood cue that, that um, it's kind of subconsciously helps you to cue in that all oh, things are getting a bit scary here. Um, and of course, you then have the, the boat. And then you've got this incredibly powerful image where when you look at the way um, the layout is and, and the boat is positioned in the text, the sky takes up over half of the... Um, over half of the image, which is quite unusual um, for an image. So again, it really draws your attention to those storm clouds. And then you've got these big waves coming up here. And this tiny boat only takes up, what, a quarter of a fifth of the image. And of course, it looks like you can hardly see the boat. All you can see is the people clinging on and it, what looks like the wave about to engulf the goat, engulf the goat, engulf the boat, excuse me. And... Um, been a long day and of course you've got the boat leaning precariously at this at this angle here with the um with the mast so visually it all builds up to really make you understand that they're in a lot of danger and this is a really frightening frightening journey and then of course you switch back to that kind of sepia style where the mum's kind of reassuring them making making them understand it's all okay you've got that close-up where the the two children are looking up at the mum and she's looking back at them And then, of course, the storm passed, and it's all okay, but they've run out of water. So, again, you feel like you're a part of this community, and you're worried. You, they're all gazing down at these water pots, which is, of course, where your attention is drawn, and you can kind of share that angst. And then you can see this big, this big kind of finger. Um, you see this pirate. And visually, this image, again, is very carefully constructed. Um, he's very big. He's right in the foreground. He's gazing down at you as if you're a very positioned as, as Ando, as a small child. And it can, helps you to kind of share emotionally Ando's reaction to the situation. So the pirates take over the boat and they steal everything that the people have got, not that they've got a lot because they're refugees. And then finally, the pirate takes pity on, on Anne and um, gives him some water, which actually enables the family to survive. So they get picked up by a ship and they come to Australia. And now this again, when you're looking at the, the color and the mood in the text, this is where it shifts again, because suddenly the text comes into a lot more full color. And you've got this wonderful picture of Sydney and the Opera House here, and the two children in, in colorful clothing. Um, and this is where they thought that Ando's um, brother was a little girl, and he rest him out in the dress. Um, again here, this is a great text 
to teach about concepts of belonging um, as a result of migration. You've got this image of the children who um, who are all kind of looking at each other. Well, they're all they're facing forward. These three people, and then this girl's looking back at them, and it creates this kind of closed loop that you're not a part of, which again immediately helps you to understand how Undo is feeling. Um, and then it goes on to talk about his early years and how things are really tough and his mum starts up a sewing business and they get robbed and it's all very difficult. And then it starts to cue into Ando himself. And as you can see, the images get very large and they're all in the foreground and they're all focusing on his experiences and his feelings. And it's where he starts to learn English and do his homework. It's where he meets his first friend through that incredible, powerful medium of handball, which I'm sure we all know can bring everyone together. Um, and then it finishes up talking about how um, Ando's parents become really proud of him because when he's um, in year five, he gets announced as a class captain. So you can see you're just focusing just this clear image with no background, you know, the emotional expression on his face and then the emotional expression of his parents again. So it's a really lovely visual text with some nice, really clear readings that, that, that support um, support the writing. Okay, so that pretty much um, wraps up the presentation for today. Um, have anyone got any questions about anything that um, we've um, gone over today? If you have, please feel free to type them into the um, to the bar down there, and I'll just hang on for a second to see if anyone's got any. And someone did ask if the presentation was available. I'm afraid the presentation um, won't be um, available um, in a hard copy format um, because obviously there are copyright issues associated with scanning in text. I'm showing these as if I was showing them to you um, as, as a live audience. Um, but of course we can't release the hard copy. However, the, um, this, the, the video of this presentation will be available on um, on the Peter website um, in the near future for you to watch again. Um, so, yeah. So it doesn't look like there's any more questions there. So, um, um, thank you very much for, for joining me this afternoon, this evening. Um, I hope you um, enjoyed the presentation. I hope you've got something out of it. And more than anything, I hope that you go back into your classrooms with um, renewed enthusiasm and, and, and vigor for using these amazing picture books and for um, really inspiring your kids to, to, to read and engage with quality literature and also hopefully for you to program thematically using these texts. So thank you very much. Um, happy uh, safe journey home and I hope if you are at home you have a well-deserved glass of wine because that's what I'm going to do. All right, bye-bye.